My name is Britta Forsberg, and I serve as the Executive Director for CF Burnegate Bay. I want to take a moment to thank everyone for joining us today, and also to thank Diane for agreeing to present to us and give us an update. So it's my pleasure to introduce Diane Salke. Her title officially, I believe, is Superfund and Emergency Management Division of the Passaic Hackensack Newark Bay Remediation Branch. Uh, she works for the EPA, and she's our guest speaker today as the Remedial Project Manager for the Sibagagi Superfund site. She will be discussing the history of the site, the source remediation that has been completed, and the groundwater remediation that is still ongoing. She will also discuss the solar fields currently running and the environmental education programs conducted by the current property owners of the Superfund site. So I know that we're all anxiously waiting to learn uh, the information that you have to share. And we are recording this session for the benefit of the public who's probably working today largely and maybe couldn't attend. And we do plan to edit it appropriately and share it on our social media and other platforms. So Diane, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your information. Well, I will also be opening the screen for you, Diane. So we're getting that. Okay, thank you. I apologize. For some reason, my screensaver just okay. uh, share screen that uh, it's not working. So okay. just give that. us a heads up when you want to go to the next slide. Is everyone able to see that on their end? Diane, can you see that? I can see, yes, I can see it. Hopefully everybody else can. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to this um, meeting today as, yeah, I'm gonna turn my video off as well because it's a little distracting. Okay, um, as Britta had said, I am the remedial project manager for the Superfund, Sibagagi Superfund site in Toms River, New Jersey. Um, I've been working on this site since about 2011. So going on 11 years, 13, 12 years now. Um, you can go to the next slide. So, Okay, it's a PDF, that's right. Okay, so this just gives you a little orientation on where this Sibagagi site is. This is, it's in Tom's River in Ocean County, New Jersey. Um, as you can see, it's the black dotted lines there. That's the outline of the site. You could see that it is bordered by the Tom's River on the east side of the site and Route 37 is on the west side. So you can go to the next slide. Um, I don't have a lot to talk about today. I just wanted to give you a little bit of basics about the site and where we are and what we've been working on. Um, I know that this Subagagi site has been in the press a bit. That's about uh, natural resource damages claim with New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. That's between New Jersey and the site owner, which is BASF. So I can't really give you too much information about that since that's not, you know, it's not something that EPA works on, we are working on the Sibagagi Superfund site. So our role is to make sure that we protect human health and the environment at EPA. Um, so, you know, I'm really just going to talk today about the Sibagagi Superfund site. So if you have questions about the NRD claim, um, you know, there is a website. I know New Jersey has a pretty easy to access website where you can put your questions in. Okay, so this is from our, what we call a record of decision. And this is, just shows you a little bit of the planned site use when we had come up with our decision document. And what you can see, and this is just a kind of general idea, this is the 1,250 acre Superfund site. At this point, it was 1,300 acres. Um, and as you can see, the, the blue and the pink, um, especially the blue area is where the any of our site operations occurred. So um, it is a 1200 acre site and it was about 300 acres um, where any of the production and manufacturing had happened. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So just a little bit um, of a history on the site. This actually is a picture from when it was still active in 1980. I kind of like this picture. It shows what the site used to look like. Um, so as I mentioned, it's about 1,250 acres. It's in Tom's River, and they use 320 of those acres for manufacturing dyes and pigments and resins and epoxy additives. Um, this started um, with Sibagagi in 1952, and then they ended up stopping all operations in 1996. The site was originally owned by the Tom's River Chemical Company, which later merged and became the Sibagagi Corporation. And then in 2008, 
Tibagagi was purchased by BASF and they are now the site owner and they are the ones that we deal with for all the remediation activities that are currently ongoing at the site. Um, and based on contamination that was found on the site in the 1980s, it was placed on the Superfund list, the National Priorities list in 1983. And that allows EPA to take charge and start um, addressing the contamination that was found at the site. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, when EPA has a large site like this, it is 1,200 acres in total, um, we address it in, you know, different operable units, we call them different pieces. So. First, our first operable unit focused on a contaminated groundwater because we wanted to prevent that from getting off site any more than it already had. And because people, you know, we want to make sure nobody was consuming and nobody was drinking the water at the site at the time. Um, so one of the first actions we had done is make sure that everybody was switched over to public water and no one is drinking the contaminated groundwater. And what New Jersey puts in place is um, what we call a CEA, it's um, classified exemption area. So nobody's allowed to put any wells in there for drinking purposes right now to this date. Wells are not allowed to be installed in this, in this zone of air, contaminated groundwater. So we began treating the groundwater in 1996 um, by, you know, during their production, Sibagaygi had, had actually treated their own wastewater so in 1996, we started using that infrastructure to treat the contaminated groundwater. Um, and it worked, we we're able to treat the contaminated groundwater, we pump it out of the wells from the ground and treat it and then discharge it on site. Um, and then in 2014, when BASF was in charge, they optimized this uh, pump and treat plant, we call it. So instead of using the old groundwater treatment facility, they, they constructed a brand new pump and treat with an air stripper. It's a much more modern and efficient um, treatment of contaminated groundwater. So we are still continuing to this day to treat the contaminated groundwater. It's being discharged on site. Um, you can see if I had time to that little blue dot up at the corner is our discharge area. Um, and the second operable unit is the source areas. And so that is what we, basically the soil, right? So this, a lot of this contamination was um, found to be in drums that were buried in, you know, contaminated lagoons that were on site where, you know, during production times, things were just discharged to the ground. So our separate, separate second operable unit was a source area remediation is what we call. So all the sludge, the waste that we found were cleaned up. Um, so this, we started this in 2003, and we oversaw the entire operation. This was still Sibagagi at the time. And what we did was we dug up and treated over 341,000 cubic yards of soil. Um, we took out 47,000 drums, which had contaminated material, and those went off site. And we treated a lot of this soil on site with bioremediation, and then we in, in three locations, we put the soil back and capped it with a, you know, grass cover and um, what we call a slurry wall to keep it from getting into the groundwater. It's basically like a layer that goes underground to keep it from going into in the groundwater. Um, so we, you know, from 2003 until we were finished in 2016, we oversaw Sibagaygi and um, the eventually BASF clean up all the contaminated groundwater. These purple areas that you can see are all source areas. Um, there was different, different locations that were used for different parts of the production. Different dyes were disposed of in certain areas. So there's one location in the center of the site um, that looks like a rectangle. That's called the equalization basin. And we're still working on treating some of the contamination that's still coming from there. It's a little more difficult because it was deeper and it was difficult to remediate. So we are capturing any of that contamination in the groundwater, treating it and discharging it on site. Um, and you know, we, we monitor their discharge. Every time they discharge, they meet all the levels they've been required to since they started this pump and treat system. Um, let's see what else. And we, so we completed this action in 2016, treating all the source, all the soil on site and this, the fence, the site has been fenced in, so nobody, you know, uh, is able to access the site. Um, so we did, con like I had mentioned in the beginning, we did finish the soil contamination, and now we are still working on the groundwater. It takes, 
you know, once this type of contaminants get into the groundwater, it takes a long time to get them out. Um, we estimate when we start 30 years and we started in 96. So it's, it's a long process, you know, we are keeping it from getting any further. Um, I'll show you that. You can go on to the next slide. Um, so basically these are the wells that, this is all the wells that we, we pump the groundwater out of the ground and bring it into our treatment facility, which is right there in the center. And then we discharge it on site. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this you can see is um, the groundwater plume. We call it, you know, when, when this contamination is in the groundwater, we consider it to be a plume when it's large enough. And the blue is where we started in 1996. And this green area is how the plume has shrunk. And this was 2020, I believe. Yeah, this compared 1996 to 2020. Um, so you can see it shrinks. It does take time, but we are pulling, you know, pulling it in. As you can see that on the left side, there is that green. That's only because it probably would have been blue, but we didn't have data from back in 1996. We didn't have wells over there at that point. Um, so we don't know exactly what it was in 96, but since we did this remediation of the soil, we have wells in that area now. So you can see it is getting smaller, but it is a slow process. Um, so EPA oversees all this groundwater treatment. You know, the BASF completes reports. They go out and they sample it twice a year. Um, EPA has their own oversight contractor that goes on site, watches the sampling, collects split samples, and gets those analyzed by a separate laboratory. And then EPA and the contractors, we review all the reports that BASF produces um, concerning the groundwater and any remediation that's ongoing. And we also do what we call five-year review reports. And those kind of sum up everything that's happened at the site since we finished the contamination of the soil remediation. And um, it summarizes, it's a good piece of information if anybody really wants to read about the site, it is on our website. Um, so you can see the five-year review, it sums up everything that's been done, that's ongoing, that we're still working on. The last one we did was in 2018. So I'm actually working on our next five-year review. It's the fifth one <laughs> since we started our five-year reviews. Um, so in the next month, probably about mm, February, we'll be releasing our next five-year review. And it, it's a good summary of the site. It tells you about the history and what we've been working on and you know any of the remaining contamination issues that we're still working on. Um, so, you know, just say, just to kind of push this home is that we are still monitoring the groundwater. It is still contaminated with organic, mostly organic contaminants. We still, you know, it's still being pumped and treated every day, millions of gallons of, of uh, almost a million gallons per day of groundwater gets pumped up from this site and treated and discharged on site. And that discharge, of course, gets sampled to make sure it's, it's, you know, all the contaminants have been removed enough to go back into the groundwater. Okay, you can go to the next site. So something that has happened in the last few years in 2019 is that BASF had leased 166 acres of their land for a 35 megawatt solar array system. So this is that footprint you saw on the earlier slide of where all the production was done, this area that will remain, you know, restricted from any public access because this is where, you know, our pump and treat system still is. Um, and so a good use of this property is for solar um, because it is, you know, flattened areas and we were able to put all of these solar panels within this footprint of the former industrial part. And it's a 35 megawatts, one of the largest in New Jersey. It is active right now and it's connected to a um, transformer on site. There's also a two megawatt that just runs the pump and treat system, which is great. So if we do end up running, you know, another storm comes through like it did with Sandy and we lose power, we're able to continue to pump and treat the water. Um, so it has its own separate metered system that, that uh, runs the pump and treat system. And they just, I believe, are finishing the five megawatt community solar project. So this will provide lower cost electricity to look so to certain parts of the community um, and it's almost complete. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's just some figures of what it looks like. Um, it's actually pretty cool to say there's a, it's a lot, it's a large solar field. Um, and then finally, the next slide is something that BASF has been working on 
well, for about five years now, and that's environmental education. So it actually started with an AP environmental science class reaching out and saying they were interested in doing some studies at the site. And it's kind of grown since there. So these students come out um, to areas of the site and they go and they watch, they count deer, they set up cameras and they do wildlife studies where they're counting deer. They've also done a pollinator garden. There's nest boxes and BASF will tour them. They're not allowed on, you know, on site without a tour, but they will take them through certain areas and allow them to set up their equipment. Um, and it's been a great outreach program and the students love it. They get a lot of requests, mostly in local high schools. So you can go to the next slide and see a few more pictures from, our, from the wildlife cameras, um, which are a lot of fun. Um, but the students really seem to enjoy it. And they've been doing, I mean, you know, COVID definitely put a hamper on this, but before that they've been doing this wildlife um, educational program for the last few years. Um, and that's pretty much all I have about Sibagaygi. I am open to any questions you have, like I said, about the site itself. I can't really talk about the NRD claim, but if anybody wants to talk about, you know, put some questions in a Q&A about the site, I'd be happy to answer them. All right, so Britta and I will field these questions. So feel free if something comes up um, as we go through these, just stick it in the Q&A and we will uh, address them, hopefully all of them. So the first question that I am seeing is from Ed, could you please expand on what bioremediation consists of? Ooh, okay, um, I can give you very basic. So they, they built this large structure and basically they, they sampled certain parts of the soil. And if it was over a certain level, it had to go off site. But if it was under a certain level, they basically laid it out in a building um, and they would turn it over and then they would add certain critters. And I can't tell you offhand what exactly those are. And then they would allow it to basically consume the contamination. And then they would kind of turn it over, like to aerate it and they would sample it. and if it would, once they get to a certain level, they would discharge it, or they would put it into a pile on site that they buried with a cap. Um, it's a lot more technical than that. It was, um, I, I, I can, um, the report has everything laid out in detail and exactly the species they used and the time it took. And, you know, I can give you anybody more details as far as that um, with the report, but that is the basic of it. much did the plume shrink by and what is its current size now? So that screen is that I don't know if I can tell you in acres but if, if you go back to that I don't know if you can just pull that back up but that is the plume shrinkage right so the plume and in, initially was that blue coloring and it's gotten to the size of the greens yes that thank you so much so the green is the current plume size so you can see it has pulled in, you know, and when when a plume changes in size like this, we we do an optimization and we've done two of them so far where we say, OK, this area is pulling clean water now. Let's move a well and put a new well in a different area. You know, they, they you want to pull it all to the pump and treat system, which is basically all the way to the left of the green. Um, yeah, like it's it. it, it so sorry, I don't have my my uh, screen up, but um, yeah, it's basically the left side of the plume. So it, going into the right side of the plume, there it looks to me. I'm just looking for you to confirm this that there's still the green portions of the plume, which would be active mm -hmm. portions of the plume, would still be under Oak Ridge Parkway and Cardinal Drives. Those two communities. Yes. That is correct. Um, you know, it, it is still under communities. That's why we don't allow anybody to drink the water. Um, there is still contamination. We don't want new wells to go in. We did what we call a vapor intrusion study at the site to see if the vapors are coming up through basements, but did not find that to be occurring at all, which is good. Um, but it is still underneath communities. It's, you know, as you can see, it's gotten smaller and we're trying to pull it back to where our, our pump and treat system is, but it's a very slow process. That's why we're kind of going after, like I said, there's one area where there's still higher levels in the center of the site 
they're thinking, you know, if we can go after that a little more aggressively and really start pumping that out, that maybe this will pull it in more. Um, but it, it, you know, groundwater contamination is difficult. It's not like the soil, we can just dig it up and remove it. You know, it takes time, um, but it is getting smaller. It's just, you know, a slow process. Um, oh. You're on mute. Oh. We have quite a few questions. So the next one is, go, you wanna do it, Avery? Uh, what are the contaminants found in the water? Are they raw materials, final products, or byproducts? Um, mostly byproducts. It's a lot of the organic contaminants that you find in a lot of, in a lot of these contaminated sites throughout New Jersey, trichloroethylene, tetrachloroethylene, and then their breakdown products, cis-1,2-dichloroethylene, um, there is some naphthalene, which was found on the site um, that's a semi-volatile, but a lot of them are the organics that were used in these processes and their breakdown products. You know, they, you know, they break down at when they're in the groundwater itself, but there's a list of 14 of them. 14. Yeah, you can find that in that five-year review report. I don't want to bore everybody with the details, but that's all in there. And we'll make sure that we connect everyone with this report too. So if you want to reference some of the uh, more finer print details that Diane is talking about here, we will make sure everyone has access to that. Uh, we have another question. Who funds the remediation? Right now it's all BASF, 100%. Um, yeah, they pay for the remediation and they pay for my oversight as well. They've took, taken on all of Siva Gaigi's, um requirements for the remediation. Mm -hmm. And when is the remediation expected to be complete? I wish I could say that we could pull all this contamination in by tomorrow, um, but groundwater just is a very slow process. We, we estimate 30 years. That's kind of our overall estimate when a lot of these groundwater contaminated sites were found, right? We said, so okay. 30, this more, will be 30 more years, you're saying? I'm, I mean, from 1996 okay. was when we, when we said 30 years. So we're, we're getting close to that, right? Um, you, you know, it, it takes as long as it takes. Like, that's, it's hard to explain because it is groundwater. I mean, from 96 to 2020, you've seen it's gotten about, you know, maybe close to half in size. So we are becoming a little more aggressive by going after, you know, the, the, one area that is a little bit higher contamination, maybe if we put some more wells in there, you know, we're, we're hoping to pull out more of that contamination and speed up the process a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it's a slow process. You know, the, the soil has been remediated, that's complete, but the groundwater is just, it takes time. Uh, we have another question. Is the blue line going through the plant a creek? Are there any creeks on site? If so, where do they go? No, well, I'm not sure what blue line he's re they're referring they to. Be, this person might be referring to the Tom's River, that kind of. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the entire east side is the Tom's River. Mm -hmm. Don't, there aren't any real tributaries. There's some wetlands close to the Tom's River. You know, there's some areas that have water, but not, but no, it's just the Tom's River, up, if that's the figure I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. This is another question. It's almost like a follow-up, but it's for a different person. The present groundwater treatment process, where is the treated water actually released to? Into the Toms River or a different receiving water body? Basically a different receiving water body. So it's called a discharge area. So they construct almost like a man-made wetland and that's where we pump it into. And so far it's been doing really well where it's not filling. I mean, it's probably about 50 feet, maybe a hundred, maybe a hundred feet from the Tom's river. So eventually it does, it will get to the Tom's river. But we don't discharge directly to the river. It's called a discharge area. So it naturally goes back into the groundwater and will make its way over that way. Um, but remember, it, we know it's met all of our cleanup levels. We test it regularly to make sure that everything's been treated, removed, and we sample it. Um, by state law, it's a permit for the New Jersey, and we have to make sure we meet those discharge levels before we can put it into the ground. Um, but yes, it's, it, it eventually makes it to the Toms River, but it's not directly into the Toms River. Thank you, that's helpful. We have another question. Can you identify where we can find the monitoring reports from the beginning or year by year? 
Yes, they should be on the website, but if not, I will make sure that I will up, put them all on the website. So Wasipagagi has a website. Um, it's one of our EPA websites, and that is where all the groundwater reports are and the five-year review, review reports. Um, but I will make sure that I will have that as a to-do list to make sure I put the last few up there. All right. Thank you. And that can be a part of our piece that we're sharing with everyone. Um, Diane, we'll make sure that we have that and send the link Absolutely. out to people so they don't have to go searching for it. Yes. Thank you. Next question is, what is the percent decrease or percent remaining? I'm assuming the person means of the, the groundwater pollution plume. Um, that I'd have to look into as far as giving you numbers, um, you know, just from the figure, we've probably gone down about 40%, right? Maybe there's about 60% remaining, but that's a very, you know, kind of just ballpark. Um, we do have better numbers, but I'd have to look them up, but I could follow up with you on that. Maybe a note. Okay, next we have also regarding the upgraded remediation implemented by BASF in 2014. How does that differ from what was previously performed by both the NJ, New Jersey, the EPA, and Sibagaygi? So, as I had mentioned, Sibagaygi treated their wastewater on site. They had these, I, I don't know the size, they were enormous, huge vats that would hold the groundwater and they would add powdered activated carbon daily, pounds of it, and basically kind of agitate it, stir it around. Um, and it, it worked to get rid of the um, contamination. The outflow was met the requirements, but the waste from the carbon was so high because it was basically powdered carbon they would add and <laughs> mix it almost like it's a big cauldron. So now we use a much more modern used for groundwater and it, the groundwater gets pumped in. And one of the biggest things we do have to remediate, remove at this site is iron, right? There's naturally occurring iron in this area, it's the Tom's River. So we have a process to take the iron out first, and then it goes to what we call an air stripper. That's a very um, typical treatment of groundwater for volatile organics. So it goes through an air stripper, and then it goes through what we used to use is these, these um, what they're called granulated activated carbon. So, so there's these tanks and it goes through the tanks and then it comes out at the end, the far end. Um, so we basically added an air stripper and we added, a, I think a few of the carbon tanks and we got rid of the process of stirring in the powdered carbon. But just like before, it still meets the same numbers. It always has, it has that hasn't changed. We have a question also, what did the slide that referred to the solar panels not breaching the cap? What's the cap? So when we treated that ground, the, the soil at the site, we put it in these areas. It's not a landfill, it's basically because it was already treated, but it has a cap, a cover, and that's grass. In fact, they use native grass seeds. Um, so there's two areas that we put treated soil back in and we covered it with a grass layer. and when we put the solar panels in, we don't want to damage that cap, right? Because we, you know, we put in a, a cap, a layer, you know, a protective layer, and then so sand and soil over that. Um, so we don't want to damage that cap because, you know, that's part of the remediation. So we put these, what they're called ballasts. So the, none of those solar fields are going through the ground. They're all just sitting on these really heavy um, concrete slabs that sit on top of the cap. Okay. These, this question might be a little bit more difficult. Uh, what is the exact conceptual and legal boundary between EPA Superfund and the NRD, given that they both directly involve the consequences of environmental harm? Sorry, that was long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the entire site is the Sibagaygi Superfund site. Um, as Like I said, as far as the NRD claim, like uh, that's between BASF and New Jersey. I would rather them answer that question. Okay. Uh, next one is, so the first question, <clears throat> when did you charge, sorry, change to groundwater begin? Originally, it was to be discharged into the river with the understanding the standard for discharge to the river was substantially greater than the discharge to groundwater. 
we still use this it could, because it eventually goes to Tom server, we use those same discharge requirements um, that were set up by New Jersey. So we meet all, it's in what we called, so, so you know, when you look at the original record of decision from the 80s, it was a discharge to the ocean, right? And then that changed through a, a follow-up document called an explanation of significant difference. And that, what we call an ESD, where we came up with, we all agreed to different certain numbers to meet. And those are the numbers and they're still the same numbers from all the contaminants that we have that we have to get to, you know, a certain number for, um, for copper. I mean, for um, iron, in fact. So we can't discharge it to the, to the river. I mean, it's, it goes to what we call a seep area, but it, like I said, it does eventually go to the river. So none of that has changed. You know, these go, but these same um, numbers we're trying to meet go all the way back to that original rod record of decision and explanation of significant difference which is from the 90s um, but that that hasn't changed we're still meeting those same numbers the same requirements of river discharge okay out of curiosity diane you have a lot of knowledge about this are how long have you been you know assigned to this particular site seems like you so have I I started actually in, my, in the Edison office, um, which is our field office. And then in 2011, I became our media project manager and I was assigned five sites in New Jersey. And this is one of them. So it's 2011, 2011. Quite a few years. Yes. <laughs> How deep uh, are the wells is another question that we have. Uh, um, so there's different aquifers, right? They're, they're so about, I think the lower one is about 40, 50 feet and the deeper one goes, in, so this is, so there's different aquifers and that are contaminated with this, with this ground, that are contaminated with um, these chemicals from the site. Um, and then there's a much deeper aquifer as well. So the two, the primary and the lower are, I wanna say 40 to 80 feet, somewhere around that depth. Okay. Uh, we have another question. I think you might have mentioned this just kind of as a side note. Uh, there is a discrepancy with the green and blue like plume outlines. Um, this one says the plume has shrunk, but it's also migrated outside the original blue area on the west side. Why is that? Is that a concern? So this might just be a clarifying point there. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's a good point to see. So it did, it's not migrating. We just didn't have data back then. So we didn't have the wells in that area. So if we did, it probably would have been blue, right? It, it, you know, it hasn't moved west at all. It's just gotten smaller, um, especially on the eastern side. But when we did the remediation on all those source areas, we put a bunch of new wells in. So we didn't have a well right there. We have a well on the other, you know, further out that shows, you know, when you first come up, you know, figure out exactly where your plume is, you put wells everywhere to figure out exactly where it is. So we have wells further to the west, but you know, we didn't have any right there. So that's the only reason that that shows like that. Um, it didn't migrate. I think it just always was there. We just didn't see it at that point because it's, it's, you know, it's in the middle of the site. Our concern was always, especially on the east side where the communities are. And then the more we investigate, you know, as a site progresses, the more you put new wells in and, you know, things do change and you see new things. So um, in the early 2000s, I would say is when those wells went in. Okay, another question. Years ago, there was great concern regarding the permitted industrial lined landfill perhaps being leaky. It was determined that the landfill was not part of the Superfund responsibility. However, do you know if this issue has been investigated independently of the US EPA supervised activities? Yes, I know all about those. I know about those landfills. So they are New Jersey regulated landfills, so they are under, they are located on the EPA Superfund site, but they are New Jersey regulated landfills. Um, there was three cells and two of them were removed, I believe, and the one is still remaining, but they monitor the, um, any leachate that would be coming from there and they have wells all around the landfills. So, I'm sorry, the question was, whether or not, uh, do you know if this issue has been investigated independently by the EPA uh, or su supervised okay. activities? It's under New Jersey, so it is being investigated. It is continued to be monitored. It's actually, the landfill itself has been closed. It's a closed, considered a closed landfill now. 
Um, but it is still there. It is still landfill on site, but it is monitored. Um, New Jersey monitors any of anything that comes off the landfill. It's called leachate. They also monitor the groundwater mountain landfill regularly. So, so yes, they do investigate it. Either. Sorry. <laughs> it sounds like they're not EPA supervised. They're New Jersey DEP supervised. That's correct. But they are monitored. Absolutely. Okay. How much of the plume has infiltrated the Toms River in both areas, including the winding stream? Okay, good question. So we, as part of our annual groundwater monitoring, we also monitor the Toms River. And we haven't, I mean, in the earlier days, they did find some contamination in the Toms River, but the last, so since I've been on the site, we haven't seen anything in the Toms River. So I have a couple of questions that kind of could fit together, but are from different folks. Uh, why would BASF buy a site like this? And the other question is BASF purchased it or was paid to take it? So the language I know is that they acquired the site as far as their purchasing. You know, that's not something we're privy to. Like, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know why they would. I, you'd have to ask BASF that question. Um, you know, I, I believe some parts of Steve Guy was still active at the time, not this site, but maybe others, you know, maybe there was something profitable for them. I don't know, but they also acquired the uh, liability here and at other sites. I have um, treat it how, how does an air stripper work? So, oh, um, basically it, so as the groundwater is getting pushed up through the air stripper, there are, there are, chem, it's not chemicals, but there, I believe the air that's pushing through it will take the um, chemicals off and maybe some additives they add. And that goes into, you know, becomes air, air with maybe contamination, then that goes through a cleanser before it goes out and that has to meet an air permit. So that's also monitored um, because these are volatile organics, right? So basically you're just using air to strip them off the, off of the water. And then um, the next step is these granulated activated carbons, which are like um, large containers with carbon in it. And then that get, gets rid of any of the remaining contamination. Most of it gets removed from the air stripper but what we call polishing, the next steps is to get rid of anything that's remaining. And it goes through this one carbon unit into another, into another, and eventually that carbon has to be cleaned. Okay, and is that something that's overseen by the EPA or the DEP? EPA, that's all part of EPA. Um, we, you know, this is part of our groundwater treatment because it's a super fun site. So we make sure that this water is getting pumped and treat. And with this new treatment system, it's very automated. It's all run by computers and you can see exactly what's there, what's, you know, which wells are coming from. And, you know, again, iron is a big issue at this site. I can tell you that it is, you know, it clogs up the pipe, the pipes and they have to be changed out regularly. The pumps have to be changed out regularly. There's a lot of maintenance that goes on because of the naturally occurring iron because getting that iron through the system clogs it up. Um, so yes, EPA is, is very involved in the all groundwater, you know, all aspects of the groundwater contamination. I'm gonna tell you. Get, get the reports that show, you know, what levels that they've met every level. Thank you. I'm gonna tie the next two questions together because they're similar. Is there mm -hmm. ongoing data collection on cancer incidents? And are there any studies on cancer rates, et cetera, in this area? There's been nothing that I know of, um, aside from work that was done many years ago with okay. the health department. Um, someone else says, all cleaned up, aren't there still buried drums on the site? Well, we EPA removed all drums associated with this the Superfund site. Um, I believe there may be still drums in the New Jersey regulated landfills that are, you know, covered, monitored, you know, anything that comes off those is, is monitored, but there may still be drums in there. We did remove any drums we found. 
Um, is the process ever complete? <laughs> there is, you know, the end go goal is to be removed from the national priorities list, right? Like that, that is the last step in any super fun site. Pro so that is always our goal. Um, if we can remediate the contamination to, a, you know, maybe to a level where it's very low and it can naturally finish off if there's anything remaining, that's our end goal. Um, right now, we're not there. You know, we still have contamination in the groundwater. Um, and we still have these caps to maintain. We're not, you know, this is not, we're not, we're not there yet. <laughs> okay. Um, is the air emissions of the stripper also treated? Yes. It goes through a cleanser. Are the sediments in the Toms River on the east side of the site impacted? When we first started looking at this site, we, you know, we did what's called their remedial investigation and we looked at everything. You know, you try and figure out where is there any contamination? Where is this coming from? Where is it going to? And we sampled all, we sampled the sediment, the water in the Toms River. Um, and no, it's not, a, from what we found, it has not impacted the sediment. Um, we did find in the early days, we found some in the water from the groundwater coming through. But um, since we've been able to pull the plume back and treat it, it's got, we haven't found anything in the Tom's River since. Another sediment question, is the cap a clay material like a landfill cap to prevent precipitation from releaching residual pollutants? It's a geotextile layer. Um, I can't remember if there's a clay layer. I would have to look into that, but I can. Um, but there's, there was a geotextile layer plate lace, but I can look into the cap layers. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. The Tom's River is a C1 water body. Will the discharge be used uh, to be cleaned up to that standard? In other words, drinkable and fishable. That I would have to refer to New Jersey. Um, they're the ones who classify the water. Um, I'm, I'm not sure the answer to that question, but I can ask. Just, um, that'd be great. What solar arrays in New Jersey are larger? Is this the largest? I think it is the largest. Um, there was one point I was hearing about another one in South Jersey that may have been a may have been larger in size, but I don't. I'm not sure. It's if it's not, it's very close. Okay. And then a follow up to that: Did the EPA approve the solar arrays, and to what extent is that customary? Yes. I mean, if, if anything is getting developed on our EPA Superfund sites, yes, we are a part of that process. Um, and we thought it was a good use because this land can't be used for really any, there's not much else we can use this land for. Um, so yes, EPA was involved. We read the reports, we reviewed it. We agreed that, you know, nothing would penetrate the cap, right? It would be on the ground level. Um, so yeah, we were a part of those discussions. There's another person, but similar line of thinking. Question about the solar field. Two megawatts are being used to power the groundwater remediation facilities, and five megawatts are going to a community solar project. Do we know how much income the site generates from the remaining 33 megawatts? So they go into the grid. They so it's not, yeah, it's not that, it's not that simple. Um, it's very complicated. Even, even the one that powers the groundwater pump and treat, BSF still has to pay for. So it's, it basically goes into the grid and however JCPNL works that out, I'm not sure. Um, but it goes into the overall grid. Okay. Um, are there known contaminants that are being kept on the site in quote unquote capped locations? Has the Superfund program located all known and unknown locations of contaminant containers? Yes, we believe we did. I mean, we, you know, we did a thorough job in the 80s and 90s. You know, you, you know, when you really start investigating, you find things, right? That's when you find the piles that were buried. You look into records and see where things happened, you know, going way back. Um, and we did treat the soil on site with the lower level soil with the bioremediation, and then we put it under a cap, yes. Um, we monitor the groundwater outside all of those caps to make sure nothing is getting out. Um, 
you know, I, I don't believe that we've missed anything. Um, we, you know, you go through all the records, like I said, of where anything was stored, what was this building used for, how is the waste discharged, and then you investigate and you sample and you sample more and then you sample more and, and then you design exactly how you're going to do this and then you could sometimes will sample more um, until you feel comfortable that you've, you know, found where the contamination's coming from and addressed it. Uh, whose landfills were they, Sibagagi or municipal? And you might want to describe what a landfill is from your point of view. I'm so I, I believe they started as Sibagagis. I think they actually dumped their, their waste in drums and put them into these landfills. Um, and I know two of them were taken out. And then New Jersey, I don't know exactly when, but New Jersey took ownership and it became a New Jersey municipal landfill. And a landfill, you know, if it's done, the, you know, it can have a liner underneath it. It often has a liner on top. Um, and if any groundwater gets in or any rainwater really gets into it, then that water becomes um, what we call leachate and that is monitored. You know, there's ways that basically there's piping around landfills that captures anything that's coming off of it and it puts it into a certain area. Um, and any of that leachate at this site gets pumped back to the pump and treat system and sam sampled first. Um, but I'm not sure when it became, probably when Sibagagi closed down, when New Jersey took ownership of those landfills, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned the closing off of the discharge line from the Sibagagi plant site to the Atlantic Ocean. When was that and how has it been monitored for effectiveness? Further nominal releases, et cetera, is it still monitored today? That hasn't been used since production. So I believe that um, that was Sibagaygi's. EPA never actually agreed to a discharge to the ocean. So once EPA started with the remediation, you know, that was our plan and our record of decision, but based on public comment, that was never enacted. We never built the piping. We never did anything with that because it was agreed that it'd be better to go on site discharge. Um, and they sip the seep area. So they created a seep. So since we've been active on the site, it's been, that's been our only discharge. Is there an LSRP, which is a licensed site remediation professional on the site and an RFS posted? Um, LSRP may be involved with the NRD claim. So LSRPs are a New Jersey DEP um, program with nothing to do with APA. So if there is, it's through New Jersey. I, I'm not sure. And so it sounds like there's no coordination with you if there is. Um, I mean, an LSRP is basically a contractor that would work on a New Jersey site. This isn't a New Jersey site, this is EPA. If they do have an LSRP for their landfills, that's possible, but I, I've only worked with New Jersey personnel when I've talked about the landfills with them. Um, and as well as with the NRD claim of only talk to New Jersey people, but I do know they use LSRP a lot for their own contaminated sites. Thank you. And I know you probably feel battered with questions and, but I, it's okay. you're okay to stay. I think these are all great questions and helpful answers. So is sure. there any estimation of the timeline in which the affected groundwater would be considered acceptable? Like I said, we in 1996, we said 30 years. Um, I don't think we'll get there. I think I'm hoping that, you know, with our extra efforts of going after those higher levels and, you know, the basically the wells that have the, the highest levels, we can really go after those areas quicker. Maybe it can be expedited a little, but it's, it's just so hard to say the timeline. I wish I could, <laughs> I wish I knew. Is there a chance that changing hydrology could impact the plume in the near future, i.e. rising water tables? Changing height, so I don't really understand what, what would be changing. I mean, you know, when municipals put in wells, right, for, you know, increased wells, production wells, that changes the hydrology, like the hydrology changes. 
um, just from pumping, you know, our wells, which aren't even nearly as large as like, you know, drinking water wells are, but you know, it, it, it does change, but we want it, like we want it to change. We want to pull the contamination to the pump and treat system. And, um, but I'm not really understanding what the question is, what, what's changing. I mean, overall it's changing. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's drought seasons, there's high water seasons, but, um, I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay. What happens once the site is off the national priority list? How is it classified? Are there restrictions the land can be used for? Yes. So it depends on the site. So sometimes um, it, you have to, you clean up a site to a certain level. And if it's not residential, then the site will always have to be protected from residents being built there, um, which for this area is how it, we would never allow homes to be built in the area right now they're under solar fields but um so there will always be what we call institutional controls where you know certain areas are not allowed to be developed um in this area I'm, I'm looking at my screen but um the area where the production was where the solar fields are will not be residential so that would be something that would always stay in place um sometimes if we leave a little bit of now we leave some contamination on site we still have to do those five-year review reports so even deleted sites, sites that are no longer in the MPL, um, in fact, I used to have one, I still had to do five-year review reports every year because there was a little bit of contamination left. Um, so EPA doesn't just walk away. Okay, this is a different person, but somewhat related question. If the land under the solar field is suitable for that industrial use, meaning the solar fields, I assume, what mm -hmm. was the remaining land deemed to be without value for the purposes of taxation by the municipality of Tom's River? Um, Why was it? Yeah, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? I was a, I'm a little confused. If the land under the solar field is suitable for industrial use, why was the remaining land deemed to be without value for the purposes of taxation by the municipality of Tom's River? Okay, so that, yeah, I, that I can't answer. I'm, I don't know. That's between Tom's River and BASF. I, I don't know the answer for that one. I mean, the only, these, these 300 acres that are under the solar fields is the only area that production occurred at. Um, but the entire area, all 1,250 acres are a super fun site. You know, regardless of what the land use is, they are still considered, they are in our zone of, you know, our uh, boundary of the Superfund site. Okay. If New Jersey EPA hasn't looked at the supposedly closed pipeline from the plant area to the ocean, how is this assessed or mon monitored since it seems poorly thought out to not examine this, its potential for further leakage, seepage, et cetera, and the impact on more Eastern regions of Tom's River, the Barnegat Bay and shore communities, Seaside Heights and Ortley. So, you know, as I said, EPA never constructed any pipes that go from the site to the, to the ocean, you know, and when you do this remedial investigation in the early days, if you find pipes at that point that, you know, are there, then those would be stopped. Like they would be blocked off, removed, um, I would have to look into way more of the history to see exactly what was done. Um, I'm, I'm not, I just might not know, but there, it's not still, like, there's nothing going through them if they are still there. Like, when you find something, if you find a drainage in a, in a building, you realize, okay, that's an area that the contamination could have come through. So if we found pipes, then we would stop them. We'd remove them, we'd block it off, we'd close them. Um, I, I, that I just don't know. I haven't seen anything about that in the history of the site, but that um, I could see if I could find anything in my old files about okay. that, but um, I don't know. We have a lot of questions about that. Um, is the okay. around the ocean discharge pipe polluted and is it being cleaned up? Okay, there's, I mean, if there is still pipes, they're not being used. Right. Not since the 80s, not since EPA took over. Right. And since, well, since they stopped operations in 96. Um, but I, I can look more into the ocean discharge pipe. That'd be great. Did yeah, the EPA, that, I 
Sorry. Okay. <laughs> the EPA blessed the recreational uses of the site that are being proposed in the NRD settlement proposal. Bless is an interesting word. Um, so we talked to New Jersey about their plans for the NRD settlement, yes. We, we, you know, this is between DSF and New Jersey, but it is a super fun site. So yes, we've been in contact with New Jersey about them. Okay, how will climate change and rising water levels affect the site and the cleanup process? So it's actually interesting because I, as part of my five-year review, if all five-year reviews come that come out now, we have to do an assessment of climate change. And there's a lot of these screening tools online. NOAA has one and you could put an area in and see how sea level rise would impact it. And, you know, from all the, the I mean, and they're just models, you know, um, but from everything I've seen, this is far enough inland that it, you know, if you, if you put in a town, you'll see, you know, the current state and then you see if sea level rise went up four feet, you can see where the water comes in and Tom's River would be impacted. But this site is far enough impacted and you could see this in my five year review report that um, it wouldn't be, you know, that the impact wasn't that great from these models. Um, however, power outages are a factor, um, but, you know, there wasn't, I didn't see a large impact from the modeled climate change, um, but I did do an assessment because we, you know, it's part of our, our five year review. We're looking at everything that's going on with the site and how it's impacted in climate change. And we, I ran through a number of the models and um, it didn't seem to be as impacted as wildfires would be, interestingly enough. If you do the wildfire assessment on that, it's called risk factors, one of the tools we use. And if you look at wildfires, and actually was a lot more of a concern of wildfires because, because of the wooded area than from flooding. I was just gonna bring that up. Another guest said, are the caps at risk of damage via wildfires or controlled burns? Um, I mean, it ha <laughs> hasn't happened. Um, they are, you know, that right now they're, they have the um, solar fields there, but before that they've always been maintained by BASF, basically mowed, right? So the grass doesn't get too long. Um, but I know that re re BASF required the solar field the solar field company to install all kinds of fire mitigation. So, you know, it, it would, it's less grass now because of the field, um, but there's a lot of um, fire mitigation tools that are part of their contract with the, this solar company. So I'm gonna assume that potentially that means fire could be a risk to the caps? I mean, it would burn the grass off, right? That's all that would really happen. And they would, we would require them to rep replant it. It would just, it wouldn't actually impact the cap itself. You're not gonna burn through the soil, um, but the grass would burn and it would be required. We, we would make them replace it if we had that kind of damage. Have the animals on site been tested? With wildlife? So as part of the remedial investigation, you do what's called a risk assessment and you look at how the ecology, the, the uh, birds and critters and are impacted by the site. And you kind of make assumptions that because there's this contamination, it would impact the animals. Um, that's what we typically do at super fun sites. So no, as far as I know, I don't believe any of the animals, any tissue was sampled for the risk assessments that were done in the eighties, but because there's a risk to them, we treated the soil and we removed the soil. So they would have been impacted by the contaminated soil. So they are at risk. So therefore, because of that, we addressed it. You know, that's what makes us do this work. You know, that's our requirement is that if there's a risk to humans, um, then we have, you know, we, we address it. This is what we did first. We had turned, made sure everybody was not drinking the water that because it's contaminated and we can't just clean it up that quickly. So we turned everybody off public water. And then, okay, there's soil that's contaminated while well, critters and birds and animals can get into that. So let's address that immediately. So then we address the soil. So we didn't sample them, but because they exist there, we address this contamination. Okay. Has the land that is currently in question regarding the DEP proposal been thoroughly investigated by the EPA? If so, what investigative 
techniques were used, for example, ground penetrating radar, et cetera? So again, I really don't want to talk about the NRD claim because DEP has had sampling done there. So they would be able to answer that. Um, but we know where the production was and the production was occurred during in these 300 acres that are the, you know, part of the super fun site. So any sampling that was done over there, um, you would have to talk to New Jersey. Um, the way EPA handles contamination is um, you basically sample it until you find clean, right? So if, if we know it's happening in this area, we're going to sample it out until we find that it's clean. In addition to climate change, will the next five-year review look at the environmental justice areas, particularly the Justice 40 areas? Yes. Yes, that is part of our five-year review. Perfect. That is something that we are concerned, you know, that we are aware of. And, um, and you know, with Superfund, it's a large part is also communicating, right? How do we communicate? How do we get our message across what we're doing to the communities and talk to people? That That is part of our environmental justice. And, you know, that's Part of why we're here, you know, we like to, we want to make sure everybody knows what's going on in the Superfine. We're always happy to talk to anybody. It's wonderful. And <laughs> just to give you a heads up, we're getting to the end of our questions. We really do appreciate your time today, but um, I have a couple more. Uh, you stated that the land that the solar farms reside on would not be suitable for much else. What then makes us think that the uses proposed by the NRD settlement are safe or acceptable uses. So the areas that are covered that, that have the land that have the um, solar panels are is where the production occurred. You know, so there was when when we investigated the site, we know that the all the production occurred on 300 acres out of the 1200 acres. Okay. And then Seems like I have a couple of comments. One comment is very cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the person enjoyed um, just the value here um, and able to ask questions and get answers. Another person said, apologies, I joined this meeting about 15 minutes late. I appreciate the update on the site. What are the primary concerns of Save Barnegat Bay with the NRD settlement? And do you have any relation to Dick Salky, who was a former EPA Region 2 official? I can answer the last one. Yes, that was my father. Oh, there you go. Apparently, <laughs> uh, there's a person who was a co-worker of your dad's. Um, okay. That's great. Um, also, uh, another person recommended a book by Dan Fagan called Tom's River, published in 2013, for a well-researched history on the site. See Bagagi in the early stages of the groundwater pollution, how it was discovered, and early actions and non-actions taken. It also includes a history of the ocean discharge piping being discussed. So if you're you know, just unfamiliar with it, most people in our community actually are very familiar with the fact that this pipe went from the site to the Atlantic Ocean for a variety of reasons. In one circumstance, the pipe broke mm -hmm. um, in the vicinity of Vaughan and Bay Avenues. And then also, you know, many people were engaged on our in our oceanfront communities with the uh, pipe going into you know, the Atlantic Ocean. So I think they wanted yeah. to share it's, uh, it's interesting that you bring that up because, you know, I've read the book and I, you know, although I'm not endorsing it, I do found, I found it very well, easy reading and very interesting. And I thought it was a very well re written book. Um, and I do know about this, the ocean discharge pipe <clears throat> from that book. So that's why I'm tentative to say anything because I don't want the book to be coming out versus what I know of the history. Do you know what I mean? So that's why I would rather look into it a little more and give you facts than go by, well, I, you know, in the book I read this and this and that. I understand all of that in the history, but, uh, you know, I do want to say that EPA never actually connected our wastewater to the ocean. Um, but what actually happened to that pipe that I know of mostly from the book, I, I want to find out now and, and tell you, you know, when it was closed off and because I'm, I just don't know my dates and my time frame, so I will look into that further. And again, I don't want to get my reading of the book confused with what I know from the history. Mm -hmm. But I, I agree; I thought it was a good book. 
So I just would say before we close, um, we thank you very much. And if there was something that you wanted to share that you didn't either get the opportunity to or didn't get flushed out in questions, a final thought, or um, you know, we can share your contact information and Absolutely. also any information that you you know may forward to us, we will gladly populate to our website. We essentially are trying to empower people with information so that they can make good decisions on their own. And in the absence of other information available to the public, this was extremely helpful. So thank you so much, Diane. And as a reminder for everybody who attended, this will be posted online on the recording of Diane's wonderful presentation. So thank you, Diane, again. Absolutely. And, I, and I've and i shared the slides. Feel free. You can put those up as well. Um, I gave you a PDF of them. That is, a, you don't see my notes. So that, that, that's perfectly good. Um, I do have a couple things I'm going to follow up with you on the ocean discharge um, C1 for the groundwater and percent increase in, oh, and the cap layers, which that's the easiest one. Um, but no, I just want to say thank you for your time. I wish I could tell you more about the NRD claim. I just, you know, I can't in New Jersey, you know, they have a website where you can put all of your questions in there. Um, but I think, you know, we are making progress with this site as a super fun site. You know, I think there's a lot of good that's happening to it right now, you know does take time to get rid of the groundwater contamination, but we are working on it. You know, we are on top of BASF um, and hopefully, you know, we can address that in the future, <laughs> in, my, in my time frame. <laughs> Thank you so much again, Diane. And thanks everyone for joining us. Again, we'll send out the recording. Hopefully you can share it with family mm -hmm. and friends and community members and everyone can get a little bit more information. Hope and you. also, I will plug our January 25th Speak Out event. So if you're interested in this conversation moving forward, if you're a community member who has stories to share, voice uh, concerns to voice, anything under that umbrella, uh, please attend that event from 6 to 9 p.m. January 25th at Toms River North High School. You can follow up with a whole bunch of information on our website, Go to safebarnabasbay.org. You'll see a giant banner at the top and just click on it and you'll be connected with all this information.